everybody, welcome to Amateur Cast, the show where we pretend to know what we're talking about. My name is Sebastian Limon. I am joined here with Kobe Leapies. It's me! It's him! I mean, wait, it's me! It's me! <laughs> oh, yeah. Keep yeah. it down. Sorry. And. It's uh, me. How have you been, Kobe? I feel like probably every podcast that has talked about this movie has done this same bit. Do you think so? It's, yeah, I feel like we're not that original. Oh, sorry. But we're self-aware about it. If you've not clicked off yet, thank you for not clicking off yet and still being here. We're amateur guys. How you doing? <laughs> uh, now we're kind of venturing into, like, ASMR territory, which I fear. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no! Try, try and guess what this is. Just try it. and guess. Just try and guess. Can you hear that? Yeah. What is that? Is that... It sounds like beans. Nope. Um, you put it around your neck. That gave it away. It's a necklace? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Just but is it like a, a chain? Necklace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a chain necklace. Oh, Just okay. like being rubbed. <laughs> Speaking of um, trying to be quiet, there's a major motion picture. That was released in 2018, right? 2018, yes. Yes. Colby, what is this major motion picture that I'm speaking of? Oh, this major motion picture, as the 1930s executives would call it, is uh, A Quiet Place, directed by John Krasinski, written by uh, Scott Beck and Brian Woods, and also John Krasinski. Um, it came out in 2018. We're going to be talking about it today as along with the sequel that just came out, uh, last week as of this recording, A Quiet Mm -hmm. Place Part 2. Correct. Very exciting. Yes. Very quiet. Uh, so to begin, um, A Quiet Place is about a family trying to survive in a post-apocalyptic world where essentially, um, aliens have come to Earth and they are these monsters that are blind and they can't see you but they have like incredibly precise and acute hearing and if you make even the slightest sound you will basically be hunted down and killed instantly by one of these guys and they're everywhere so the story follows this family um with the father being played by john krasinski and the mother being played by his real life wife emily blunt and their two children being played by Noah Jupe, who you might recognize from Ford v. Ferrari and Honey Boy, and Millicent Simmons, who is um, a real-life deaf actress and plays a deaf character in the movie, which kind of, because they've raised this deaf uh, daughter, like gives the family this advantage of knowing sign languages and, and um, having hearing aids, and so um, they're sort of able to live their life as quietly as possible and come right. up with really clever and smart strategies to get by without making sounds in order to survive and um it's a really inventive and really um i think very extremely skillfully made like horror movie Mm -hmm. um and it's pretty light as far as horror movies go it's it's more of a suspense thriller and at the core of the movie is really just a family story but there's definitely some good scares in there yeah um it's definitely uh yeah, it's not a complete horror film, which I like. It's a good thriller, but at the heart of it, it's a story about... I think that's what led John Krasinski to make the movie in the first place. I saw this interview where he said that it wasn't because it was a horror movie or anything. It was, it was a per, oddly enough, a personal story about just a man or a father trying to his best to protect his family and doing whatever it takes to make sure that they're safe. And, but like being told through this genre piece of like a horror thriller, sci-fi movie. Um, I, uh, well, before we get into it, spoilers, it's been some time. We're going to spoil this movie. Yeah. It's been out for, for three years and it was a pretty big, big deal when it came out. So yeah. So you've either seen it or you know what happens. (laughs) It was a pretty big deal. It's kind of like a modern classic, almost, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the spooks. But um, what do you think of what do you think of it, Colby? 
what 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 are what are your thoughts i'm a huge fan of this movie Mm -hmm. uh this is honestly one of my all-time favorite horror movies and one of my favorite movies to have come out in the last five years um i'm a really really big fan of it and i'd love to start with talking about the opening scene because the opening scene alone is like such an incredible piece um and it's just one of the best like exposition introductions i feel like to any sort of um world building movie when it comes to showing and not telling because again Mm. they they can't tell like they they the writers have to minimize the dialogue (laughs) as much as they can which is so impressive so the opening scene of this movie you've got this convenience store it is very clearly destroyed it is very obvious just from the set design something bad has taken place there has been some catastrophe right mm-hmm. and you've got this family walking through the convenience store two parents uh two teenage kids and one very very young kid and the young kid grabs a toy rocket ship and the parents and the siblings um immediately shush them they put their hand over their mouth they take the batteries out of the rocket ship to make sure it doesn't make any noise and immediately you understand just from the visuals and the acting okay, they can't make noise for some reason, right? Not just they can't make noise. They can't make the slightest bit of noise. Like, even when Emily Blunt is picking up the medicine, she's, like, the pills, she's not even shaking the can. Right. It's, like, very precise. Like, even the slightest bit of a pill noise is going to trigger these. So it definitely sets up the sense of tension early on. Yes. from From the opening scene, yeah. And they're all barefoot, and they're walking on, like, paths of sand that have been laid out. Right. So, you also understand, okay, they've been here for a while, and they're planning, right? Right, And they're methodical. As they're leaving the convenience store, unbeknownst to the rest of the family, the kid grabs the batteries that they've taken out. They're walking down a bridge in the forest, again, being quiet. And the first actual sound that you hear in the movie is the sound of this toy loudly going off. Mm -hmm. And the amount of like, like, like you said, the tension has been in in just a minute or two has been built and really, really strongly established and it is cut wide open. And the amount of panic that all of the actors show just in their faces and John Krasinski, especially in his body language as he just bolts towards the kid as quickly as he can yeah it, it's it's undeniable you understand this is life and death right yeah like this uh, is... you could go into this movie not knowing the trailer not knowing the premise in the first two minutes you understand what's happening what's happening yeah. without a single word being and, said which is great yeah and then some creature that you can just see a glimpse of comes through the frame and the kid is gone yep and that's the opening of the movie. And, and then you have the title card. card. Yeah. What a what strong a way, opening yeah, what a to way. a horror movie. Holy crap. It does not yeah, hold not back. Not just in the sense of exposition either, but in the sense that from the first scene, it establishes we can kill kids. Yeah. Right? In the rules of this universe, kids can die. Like any one of these people yeah. are going to die. We're not going to shy away from from killing people in this family we're not gonna try to be too um you know a lot of a lot of movies um including action adventure movies and kids movies the stakes don't feel that high if some of the main characters are young because you feel like there's no way they're gonna kill off a kid right right and in the first scene they do he's he's gone he gone (laughs) and then in the next scene after the title card the first thing they show you is that the mother is pregnant with a new baby a couple of months later. And so it's like the first thing they tell you is nobody is safe. And then they go, oh, and we've got a pregnant woman. And you are just like overcome with this like dread. Mm-hmm. It, it's really, really effective horror filmmaking. I, I agree. Um, it's weird. Like, I do really love the movie. The first one, especially. Mm-hmm. Um But sometimes I can't help but let my mind wonder the logistics of some of it. And 
it's hard because like it. I picture it. The movie's a smart B movie, to me. It's a smartly well made B movie, because it's. Mm-hmm. You mean to tell me none of them have farted? <laughs> none of them have sneezed really <laughs> loud, or uh, snore. You know what I mean? Like just stuff like that. Like sometimes mm-hmm. my brain can go to places like that, and I wouldn't think about it too much had it not explained that any sense of sound like any little the tiniest bit of noise can trigger the 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 aliens or the creatures Mm -hmm. so that's kind of in the back of my head but as time has passed it's like i i'm i revel in the craft that john krasinski has behind the camera the I care so much for these for these characters. Yeah. Like, uh, like they're definitely like, the fact that Emily Blunt is actually married to John Krasinski definitely helps. Like, it they genuinely mm-hmm. feel like a true family. But you definitely get the sense that these this is a real family, and the actual stakes are insanely high in this story. Um, mm-hmm. but um. And and as much as I can appreciate also like the craft behind the camera, the way he directs it, the the staging of certain sequences, especially the opening, the way things are told visually, um, I would not be opposed to someone saying that this is the dumbest movie ever made. (laughs) Not that it is, it's not the dumbest movie ever made, but I can definitely see someone picking apart the movie and agreeing with them. However, because it's so well made and it's so much fun and I care so much for these characters that I'm not going to be that guy and just say, well, why don't they live by the waterfall? If there's, if they can have more noise, why, uh, you know, just being snobby like that. I don't know. Like, Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm trying to say is I can, I would not get angry at someone having those opinions because they're very valid. Mm-hmm. But and but I'm not gonna be that guy because damn this is an entertaining movie. It's super fun. It's super well done yeah. and it's super short. It just flies by. I love it gets I love to the point. short horror movies, man. Yeah, I yeah, love it just gets quick, to the point. effective to the point, efficient horror movies. Right, 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 right. And but I think what also holds the movie together is the emotional aspect, which I think is the best part of the movie. I love the scares, I love the setups, I love the sequences. But what gets me, and I think what gets you, is the emotional aspect of the movie, which is the theme of, you know, family. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. like, what parents will do to protect their kids, and they'll do anything to keep us safe. And that's obviously something that's been done hundreds of times. Yeah. But I love the way that it's done here. It's super effective. And it's not... it, It definitely... It definitely earns the emotions for later scenes, which we'll get into eventually, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what saves the movie for me in, in terms of me not being snobbish about it. If it were just a stupid horror movie, I probably wouldn't care for it as much. If it were more self-aware, maybe, but because it's more of a an emotional story of this, of this family trying to survive... Well, it also happened to be a thriller. I think that's why it works for me a lot. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, re- um, regardless of any stupid conveniences or stupid jump scares or any any moments like that, uh, the emotional aspect of the movie just wins wins it for me. I mean, I'll just say this: like, there are ways you can cover up farts and sneezes. <laughs> I guess if you, if you feel like you're gonna fart and you know that that's gonna kill you, you grab a pillow and you sit on it and you clench. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, yeah, I guess. But like some of them are just sudden. <laughs> I don't know. I, I it's, it's kind of like don't think about it, just enjoy it. And I, I do. Have and either of us ever farted while recording this show, like loudly? I think I burped. I didn't fart. 
<laughs> yet, See, because we know that we're recording, and we know that the consequences are dastardly. <laughs> so we, we clench up. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta let go sometimes. Yeah, well, I can just edit these out, which is nice. <laughs> they can't do that, because they're dead. Um, Very but true. seriously, Very true. um... Yeah, I mean, this movie has so many, like, extremely clever and just smart, um, smart writing in scenes as far as building tension in creative and smart ways, right? But yeah, yeah. there is no better way to do that than just making you care about the characters. Right, that right. is First and foremost, if you care about the characters and then you put them in danger, the audience is going to be on the edge of their seat. And this movie, it, it, it John Krasinski... Um, I think the reason his contribution to this movie was so important was because he really made it a family story. Yeah, yeah. Um, the screenplay was written by Beck and Woods, and um, we gotta address the screenplay of this movie because it's one of the most out there and different screenplays um mm-hmm. that there has been in a long time, and it, or at least the original draft of it because. There was an original draft that was just by Beck and Woods, and it broke. If you re- you can look it up online and read it, it uh-huh. broke every single screenwriting rule when it comes to the formatting of screenwriting that they teach you in film school. You know what I mean? Really? All of that, um, all of that kind of restrictive stuff, all of those rules of the industry, industry standard formatting, whatever. It breaks that. It uses different fonts and different font sizes. And there are certain pages that have two words on the entire page for extra emphasis, right? It uses pictures and diagrams and graphs, all of these things that you're not supposed to do in a script um, because somebody decided. So Uh, I'm just kidding. There are reasons, (laughs) but um, (laughs) um, but all these things you're not supposed to do. They broke all of that. And yeah, um, not that that's like what you should do if you want to get into the industry. That's not right. it's not really a smart move, but it got them to get noticed by people in the industry and it got the script into John Krasinski's hands and mm-hmm. he said, you know, he wasn't even a big fan of horror movies before he read it. Um but when he did, he realized that f- before it was a horror movie, it was first and foremost a family story and he right. had just had a baby. He said that when he was reading the script he was holding his baby in the other hand and he was just crying because he was like this script is a perfect example of just how far a father will go in order to protect his family that he loves yeah yeah and so he sat down and he he reworked a lot of the script um and if you read the original beck and woods version it's very interesting to read but it's it's pretty different than the um than the version we got as far as like specific plot details mm-hmm. um john krasinski kind of normalized the script he what's different about it like if you keep it know um i believe a lot of the characters names are different and mm-hmm. i read like right before we started i read like the ending and it kind of ends on a different note the plot is like pretty you know it's not like a different plot or like different twists or whatever just different details that's interesting hmm. um uh <laughs> I think um, the script is probably, this is my opinion, of course. I think it's the worst part of the movie, in my opinion. Um, I think the best aspect is the performances, the casting, and the directing. Like, the cinematography and the way that it's shot, it's super well done. Like, it feels Spielbergian sometimes. It definitely feels like something that Stephen King would have written and Steven Spielberg would have directed in the 80s. I think so. Like, it feels like something like that. Because it not only is it a horror movie, but it has that great, like like we mentioned, the great family connection. Like, poltergeist. It feels very much like poltergeist in that way, that the reason we're scared is because we care so much about the characters that are on screen, and we are those characters right now. And so that's why we're terrified. We're not terrified because of uh, what uh, other aspects or whatever but um i do think the characters make a lot of dumb choices in this movie and I, not oddly enough i don't think I me mean, having a baby is a dumb choice because i understand i i mean i don't understand the feeling of losing a child but i love like again going back to the theme of family that no matter the danger no matter the risk 
we're gonna have a child. You know what I mean? We're gonna we're gonna risk it because we can't bear. No, we we just couldn't bear the the loss of the last one. It it almost feels like biblical in that way, like with the uh, Exodus, like the story of Moses. You know, with the with the with the Pharaoh with Pharaoh and the the Egyptians just taking out all the babies, all the Jewish babies, all the Israelites. Yet, um, Moses's mom just hiding him and taking care of him with all the danger. I love that. I love that aspect. It's like, to me, that's like insanely powerful. Well, and it gives you that scene of Emily Blunt giving birth in a bathtub and having to keep quiet because there's an alien in the house that will kill her if she makes noise. And she's giving birth. It is her, her I mean, 100% she was robbed of an Oscar nomination. She's going through um, contract contractions, right? Is that what it is? She's going to labor. Yeah, it's insane. And, and she, she's she like gives birth biting in the movie. her lip and everything. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe that she wasn't nominated for an Oscar. I think this movie got snubbed in a couple of categories, but that was the big one for me. Her it performance in Quiet Place is... Nominated mainly for like the technical stuff, huh? I think it only got sound. Yeah, which, I mean, yeah. I'm not surprised. That's what the Academy is like. Oh, the Quiet Place, good sound. Right. Give that well, that's nomination. what sticks out about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's the obvious thing to nominate it for. Yeah. But I agree. Emily Blunt gives great, great performance. Holy crap, you feel her pain. And I'm ne we're never going to know how that feels. We never are never going to know. Thank God. Yeah. But holy crap, does she, like, convey the pain and the anguish in her face. Mm -hmm. But whole so badly does she want to keep her baby safe. It's... Yeah. Yeah, but um, I do think upon rewatching it, it's weird because like for me, it had the potential to be like one of the greats, but I do think it has some pretty stupid moments. Um, I hate that stupid raccoon jump scare moment. I, hate, I knew you were going to say that. I hate it. I hate that so much. It's like, you don't need this. Um, I mean, like, thankfully, like the next sequence, like... You see the alien just eat the raccoon, which I thought was cool. <laughs> but um, I hated that. I, I There's just moments where I'm like, why are you there? Why are you doing that? Um, I don't know. But again, what saves it is the fact that I care. If I didn't care, I, I, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't even feel the way that I feel about this movie at all because I just care so much about these fa these these characters and this family from the opening. The fact that they were able to see. They witnessed, the murder, of their sibling or their family member in front of them, like the baby, and I, like I, I, that's awful, and so like from then on I was just connected with these people, and. Damn it, John Krasinski's such a great guy. Like, he's such a, like, total likable person. I love him. So, like I said, it, it's weird because it has so many dumb things about it, but at the same time, I'm with it. Does that make sense? Like, I'm aware that it's kind of silly for me, yet I'm, I'm just going for the ride. I'm not going to be snobbish here because good... Good for you, John. Like I, I was like so surprised that one that he directed this. this is like and he directs it really well. He directs it really well. Like the last movie that he directed was like some indie hipster drama, and yeah. then steps into this, and it looks like he's been making movies for some time. It's like wow. Yeah, I mean to say that it looks Spielbergian is such an incredible comp compliment to such yeah. an experienced director. Especially, I mean, we'll get to the second one, but I think the second one felt more Spielbergian. I think even better, yeah. Yeah, and even in terms of, like, directing, he's getting better, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just, like, how I feel about the movie. Um, I love it overall. I think it's awesome, and it's a lot of fun. And it's mm -hmm. it's a blast, but I do... It is still in the back of my mind, like, when I watch it, I'm like, eh, that's a little dumb. Eh, whatever. This is fun. You know, like, it, get, it mm -hmm. creeps up. It definitely creeps up. It's okay. not something that, like, uh, I can ignore or I can... Um, have an excuse for or like a reason for why that's there it's almost for like we just need to have tension for the sake of a movie yeah 
Yeah, but I think that's why I never really had issues with the screenplay because it my, my when I watch Quiet Place, my brain is so much in screenwriter mode, and like instead of thinking about it logically, I just think about oh, that's a clever way to raise tension, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Oh, having so. a nail sticking out of the stair, having a pregnant woman mm-hmm. who can't make noise, ha- like all these things. I'm like, yeah, that's just. I mean, that's if you're trying to think of things that make it hard to not make noise, that's a good one. Right, right. right. <laughs> I think um so. Like the the moment when John leaves Emily under like under the floorboard where they have the baby, and then it's flooding. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't hear the water. Like you're not gonna go and turn it off. Like I don't know. Like that moment, I'm like, dang it. Like well, wouldn't oh oh I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Okay. Like he walks off, and then you pan to the right, and then you hear the water. I'm like, you don't hear the water. But I, I I don't know. It's like, it's whatever. Like I, I like I said, the uh, the family aspect is so strong that any time my my brain starts to wonder the logistics of it, I like the the as the family aspect and just the directing, it completely overshadows that. Mm-hmm. And I want to get to like probably the most emotional part of the movie. The ending. Um, oh, like a little bit before the ending when John sacrifices himself for his kids. Yeah. Which is a great scene, not just for a horror movie, just for a movie in general. It's amazing. Yeah. It's so, Um. like, it's perfect. It's set up perfectly in the beginning. Like, because the daughter, um, Millicent Simmons, the, the, the one that Millicent Simmons, uh, plays, who's, uh, who's deaf, feels responsible for the death of the youngest child because since she's deaf, she was unable to hear, um, the actual, uh, the spaceship toy and she also gave him the toy. Mm-hmm. Not, not with the batteries, but like just gave him the toy um, but she feels responsible for the fact that she essentially kind of almost led her brother to die. And, um, we also see like her kind of making noises and the dad kind of ensuring like, okay, no, stop, stop right there. Like do like, don't make any more noise. You're just going to make things worse. Just a sense of like tension between the two. And it's set up perfectly in the beginning, or like around, it's it's leading to like the second act when Noah Jeep's character and John's character are hunting for fish or for food. And he says, um, Noah Jeep's character tells him, like, she blames herself every day. I'm like, do you love her? He's like, of course I do. And he just says, you should tell her more. And so at the end, yeah. when, when the alien is attacking Millicent Simmons and Noah Jeep in the car... And John Krasinski is like bleeding from the wound on his side. They have they meet they meet eyes, and he needs signs. I love you. I have always loved you. And I think the best part of that is a scream. It's not a manly scream. It's not a. This Hercules like yeah. I'm the man it's of the house. It's not like an eighties action hero Rambo scream. He's terrified. You can hear it. Mm-hmm. It's like a shriek almost. Yeah, it's incredibly vulnerable. Yeah, incre- yeah, exactly. It's like a, it's a great little detail, like a great that you know that yeah. he's terrified and he knows he's going to die. God damn it, he's doing it for his kids. Yeah. Such a powerful moment. I love It's just it's that wrought moment. with so much emotion and passion and and um and yeah, I mean, it's just, you're right. It's just like, it's catharsis. It's like pure catharsis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and because the scream, you know, obviously draws the alien away from the kids to kill him so that they can escape. And it's it's one of the great sacrifice scenes. Yes, I <laughs> really. agree. It's one of the best it's so that I've seen cathartic. recently. Yeah. Ever, I think. Like, I was in shock when I first saw that. Like you said in the beginning, it, it shows like when the when the kid dies, it tells the audience we're gonna kill. We can kill anyone in this movie. 
There's high stakes here. And so the fact that they kill probably the most likable character in the movie, it's like, and the main, whoa. He's the protagonist. I mean, the main protagonist, it's basically. They're yeah. all main characters, but he really is, he is the main character. He is the, yeah. he is the first and foremost. He's, he's the father, the he's feeling. the father figure, he's the leader. Yeah. He's gone. It's like, whoa. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's perfectly done. So, I mean, I don't know if you have any more to say about that moment or just about the well, movie in I general. Well, I think what makes it um, even more powerful is that throughout the movie, up until that point, um, they put you in the perspective of Millicent Simmons multiple times where uh, the camera will pan to go like behind her her ear, like over the shoulder. So you kind of understand that you're looking from her perspective and then the sound cuts out completely. So you yeah. don't get to hear anything. There's not ambient noise. There's not natural. There's nothing. It yeah. basically, it renders you deaf for a moment, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that makes the situation so much scarier because if you can't make noise, but you can't actually hear whether or not you're making noise. Yeah. It's it's so much more terrifying. It's It's like that idea. What it makes me think of is when I was a little kid, you know, my parents would explain to me, um, yeah, it sucks to feel pain, but the reason why it's important that we have to have nervous systems that make us feel pain is because if we put our hand on a hot stove and we didn't know that we were burning our hand, then we'd lose our hand. Wow. But because of pain, we know to p- pull our hand away. Yeah. This character doesn't have that tool. Yeah, exactly. Right? She can't, she can't know whether or not she's triggering an attack at any moment. So even though her her deafness gives the rest of the family this advantage, it makes the situation so much more visceral and immersive and horrifying for her. Yeah. And then it comes to play in the very, very ending of the movie where, um, we didn't mention this earlier, but throughout the beginning of the movie, they established that the father, John Krasinski, has been tinkering with um, hearing aids for the daughter mm-hmm. to try to help her hear better and to try to kind of understand the the scientifically the hearing phenomenon that's going on with these monsters right right. um at the end of the movie after he's sacrificed himself she goes into his lab and and is is looking through his the hearing aids that he's made and she takes her hearing aid and she puts it to the um the microphone that he's got and it she she pulls something and it you know it makes that like that the, loud, the uh, loud high-pitched, high-pitched screech that hearing aids screech. can do, like yeah. that tinnitus screech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it stops the alien in its tracks, and she realizes this is the alien's weakness. Its hearing is so acute and so precise that if we make this loud, high-pitched screech, we can overwhelm it yeah. and make it vulnerable. And that's how they're able to kill the alien. So the end. It, what I love about this ending. Is, and a lot of people didn't like this when it came out. I remember I really loved it. It ends on a sort of cliffhanger. It's one of the, it's an ending where you know what's about to happen, but you not getting to see it makes it so much more. I don't know. It gives it like a kind of a dramatic flair. Yeah. It makes you really, really want to see the next movie, which I think is really smart. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, ends better, with, it, it, it does that better here than in the second one, I think. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that for sure. We'll talk about I really the want to get into the ending yeah. of the second one in but comparison. I agree. To this one. I love the ending of this one. It's so badass. Yeah, it ends with all of these aliens coming towards the farm. It looks like it's hopeless, but Millicent Simmons has this hearing aid and this mic, and Emily Blunt has this shotgun, and they look at each other and they look out at the horde of aliens rushing towards them, and you understand th- the only way out is to push through, right? right? And so she takes she takes the hearing aid, she turns on the screech. Emily Blunt cocks the shotgun and it and it cuts to black. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. It, it's great. You know what's gonna happen and it ends. Perfect. Perfect. It's great. I love the ending. It's awesome. I agree. <laughs> I mean, um Good stuff. The fact that mm, I don't know. I love it. I, 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 I don't really understand why people don't like that ending. It's more that they just want to see blood, <laughs> I guess, blood and guts. <laughs> but no, perfect. It ends like both on a satisfying and a pretty badass moment. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> I thought that was it. Like, perfect, great, short horror movie. Like, this is just this one contained thriller 
great way to end it. They established that there was only three of them, or at least that they knew of. They killed one. The two of them are running at them. They know how to kill them. She she cocks the gun, cuts the black. Awesome. They're going to survive. Uh, no, there's a part two. <laughs> and I was pretty skeptical of that. Yeah, I would have been very content if it, if it was a single contained movie. And I was very skeptical I when I heard that there was a part two. Um, yeah. But we'll get into it. I, I, yeah, yeah. I honestly ended up being um, pretty satisfied. But we'll get into it. For now... Um, do you want to rate Quiet Place Part 1? Um, I would totally understand if you were to watch this and kind of pick it apart. But it's one of those movies that's almost like... Uh, it's kind of like Get Out in a way where you kind of don't need to kind of think about it. What What's uh, effective is what's implied and, and what's uh, the kind of like the undertone themes of it. Um, but oh, I love it. Um, I give it an 8 out of 10. I, I, actually, I, mean, I know I kind of like was... Uh, not trashing it, but like giving just uh, some criticisms like it. But I mean, I still think it's pretty high. I love horror. I love self-contained stuff. I love, again, like I said, it felt very Stephen King and Spielbergian. And I obviously love Steven Spielberg and Stephen King stuff is always unique and fun. And John Krasinski is a great guy. God bless him. Yeah, 8 out of 10. What about you? I give it a 9 out of 10. Nice. It's an all-timer horror for me. Love it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, you wanna you wanna uh introduce Quiet Place Part Two. You wanna tell yes. us uh what it's about? Sure thing. Okay, so Quiet Place Part Two. It was announced not long after the first one came out, and we were all like, "Huh? What? The first one ended perfectly." But um. They went ahead and made it, and it was supposed to be released last March? Yeah, last March. It was, I believe, the first, um, or at least one of the first movies that got delayed by COVID. Yeah. Um, it was supposed to come out, like, the week after COVID, like, really hit the U.S. On, like, exactly. March so once weekend. COVID hit the U.S., it was supposed to come out, like, the next Friday. They had the premiere. Yeah, some critics had already seen it. Some critics had seen it. And um, it was ready to go, and then boom! It's the funniest thing happened, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, funny enough, the first movie takes place in twenty twenty, which <laughs> I think is pretty funny. But um, yikes! Uh, Quiet Place Part Two basically kind of kicks off right where the first one ends. Besides the opening, opening is. Day one, which I think is a great way to kind of establish back into this world without spoiling, of course, but um, it's super thrilling. It's uh, It kind of shows, it, it, bro, it both uh, establishes certain characters that are coming into place later and just uh, reinforces that theme of the first one, which is the protection of family and, and, um, and so forth, but... Uh, so, it, like I said, it takes place literally once the first one ends. And we follow Emily Blunt and the two kids, three kids now, because the baby's born. And they're off into the world because the place has burned down, has flooded. And they're off to the other um, seemingly survivors that John Krasinski in the first would... would um, signal with fire you know yeah like, he would like send out radio messages to them yeah yeah in, in hopes of response exactly and so they're on routes to these to whoever is alive and can survive and they meet up with killian murphy's character and from there i don't want to give too much away in terms yeah of i the feel plot. like i feel like we're I think we're just we're, we're getting there. That's pretty much the most we can say. Yeah. Uh, we can kind of give some general thoughts on the movie, and especially on that day one sequence at the beginning. I oh, thought that was yeah. a really smart inclusion. Because not only is it just riveting to watch, like I just like watching it, it's fun, but um, this movie relies very heavily on the characters and thereby the audience feeling the effects of John Krasinski being gone. Feeling the weight of his presence being being taken away. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
because, you know, most people that saw the first one aren't going to rewatch it the night before watching the new one. And a lot of people might end up being in the movie theater having not seen the first one. When I saw it in theaters, I sat next to some random lady that leaned over to me and was like, I haven't seen the first one. Am I going to understand this? And I was like, no, no, lady, you're <laughs> not. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I highly doubt that. <laughs> but, I um, mean, I think it establishes pretty well what the first one did from the opening yeah i think yeah you don't like, you don't know as... how he he died but right, right i right. think just having him in that first scene is a really smart way of reinforcing you know his presence and his role in this family right, right, right. um and so then when it after the first scene when it cuts to um a year later and he's he's gone you you really feel um how they feel, which is just like lost without him. And like, there's these big shoes to fill. Exactly. Which I think would be my biggest criticism of the movie. Cause I think the movie feels that way too. For me, it's like, Oh, I miss John. Like, I, I, oh. It's not the same without John. I think until the end for a good while, I thought this is fun. This is good. But I miss John. I think really that was that was um, intentional again in in an emotional way, but not in a way where <laughs> you want to see the actor on screen. Uh, I <clears throat> at least that's how it was for like the first act, but then Killian Murphy's character comes in, and many times they mention how no one was like John. You know, yeah. just looking out for everybody, the bravest man alive. You know, he's he's a father. He's a man. He's like a, he's the man's man. He he's he's in charge. He's and he's looking out for everyone but himself, which uh, plays into the ending. We'll get into that, but um, I think yeah, for the first half, I was just kind of missing that aspect of what the first one was, which is the more emotional part of it i still think the scares hell i think even like the sequences and the directing and the staging are done better in this one in my opinion yeah i think john krasinski's direction specifically shines through in this one a lot stronger than in the previous one like it's even more spielbergian it, it feels even more like a director that's been doing this for a while there's yeah, very yeah. complex and very dynamic shots Especially that opening. Like, god damn, that opening is yeah. great. Like, it's I love largely how... a one take. Or it's at least edited to look largely like it's a one take. There was like yeah, one yeah. kind of obvious hidden cut that I was like, oh. Yeah, did oh, you notice that you too? Really tried to be 1917 there. Yeah, when the door opens and the car. Yeah, when the door opens. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that I was like, was oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you noticed that, that too because I was like so clearly in edit. <laughs> It was funny. I noticed it in the theater and I was like, oh, I'm like 90% sure. And then I was watching an interview with John Krasinski where he was like, you probably didn't notice this. But when the car door opens, there's a hidden cut. And I was like, I noticed, John. <laughs> I, John, you didn't hide it that well. But <laughs> Besides that, great opening. Um, yeah. And I love how sound is reinforced again when he's picking up the apples, when he's uh, opening up the bag. It's just loud. For no reason, well, mm -hmm. not for no reason, but like for, it it sets up the tension, especially once you've seen the first one, just how scary sound can be, and knowing that something's about to happen, even when there's no aliens on the planet yet, and um, yeah, again, it, it just kind of sets up Killian Murphy's character in the beginning, and it felt very uh, the mist, you know, the small town mm -hmm. being. It's, or like War of the Worlds type of stuff. I love Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't. I just love how threatening the aliens feel in that. That movie's terrifying to me. It's, I don't get scared by movies. That movie gets under my skin. And I love the setting of like a small town, like almost like a 50s B movie where these monsters are attacking like the blob or like a... Uh, the mist, like I said, or uh, mm -hmm. it came from outer space, or uh, giant <laughs> tarantula stuff. I Which love it did. That stuff. It did come from outer space. It did. Yeah. It, we the... get confirmation of that in this movie. There's like a little scene 
I don't, know, I don't think that's a spoiler. I mean, it doesn't no. play into the plot at all. No. But I guess I guess that can be like a minor spoiler if you want to be surprised. But trust me, it that doesn't affect the plot whatsoever. There's no. just like a shot where they show asteroids coming to Earth before uh, before the aliens show up. And it just kind right. of implies like, hey, that's where they came from. Because the first movie doesn't tell you that at all, which I really yeah, like. exactly. It just kind of came out of nowhere, which I think is great. See, it's interesting that you say that about missing... The dad, who, by the way, is named Lee. You keep calling him John because it's John oh, no. Krasinski, but the character's name is Lee. His name is Lee, yeah. They're yep. named Abbott. Um, like, the last names are Abbott. I'll just call him, I'll just call him, um, D- Daddy Krasinski. I'll just call him Daddy Krass. Daddy Krass? I yeah, Daddy Krass. Um, Daddy Krass. I, I thought it was really interesting that you, um, that you were bothered by him leaving because that's kind of what I liked about the movie is nice. how much it sets up. I mean, I agree with you. Like, I, I like seeing lee on screen and i miss him but i think the big thing that the movie's going for the big character arc that it's going for is there are big shoes to fill yeah and these kids need to step up and whereas the first movie is about a parent's love for their child i think this one is about coming of age it's about a child yeah, yeah. filling the role that their parents did exactly. as they grow up and I really appreciated that this gave Noah Jupe and Millicent Simmons a chance to really prove themselves even Mm -hmm. further than they have as actors. That's what I mean by the first half, I was feeling like, okay, where's John? Then the second half, I'm like, oh, I see what you were doing. That makes sense. The second half of the movie, the two of them really become the leads over Emily Blunt and Killian Murphy. And, um, I mean, for their age... We, like we we've, we've been known with Noah Jupe, all right? If you've seen Honey Boy, it is I mean, I think it must be the best child performance in the last decade. Noah Jupe and Honey Boy. One of them, at least. I would have to fact check you. But one okay. of them, he's very good in it, yeah. Which one? Which one is? I'm I'm trying to think. I'm sure there's others. <laughs> there's other good ones, but I mean, I can't think of one that's better than him in Honey Boy. I'm sure this one, at least recently. Yeah, in the last in the last decade. Uh huh. There's sure. other great ones. I mean, there's Daphne Keene and Logan. There's Roman Griffin, Davis and Jojo Rabbit. There's um. Right, right. Um, Jacob Tremblay in that in that one. <laughs> the room, room. I not, don't th- like not Jacob Tremblay. <laughs> really. I don't like his face. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just want to punch him. We're cyberbullying a 12-year-old on this podcast. <laughs> Get out of here, I, kid. I, I don't totally disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Great That's performance funny. by a young child. So you, you've yeah, but, got great actors in this movie. But Millicent Simmons, I think, more than anybody, really proves herself in this movie and mm-hmm. becomes, by the end of the movie, the lead and does a really excellent job of filling John Krasinski's shoes, both in the story sense of like, that's what her character is doing. And also in the sense of becoming the lead of this series. Right. 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 And in in that way, I think that reflects how the movie overall feels transitional. Um, because without getting into spoilers and we will in a bit, but not yet without Mm -hmm. getting into spoilers, the ending does seem like that they want to do a third movie. Yeah. I hope they do. No, they are. And it's already been confirmed that there's going to be. It's a confirmed. Third. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, when you look at great trilogies, a lot of the second movies are very transitional. A lot of them are simply A to B movies. Look at the Two Towers, right? The the Empire Two Towers. Strikes back. Yeah, Empire Strikes Back. Most of the plot is getting from point A, where the first movie left off, to point B, where the second movie starts. Right. And don't and the second movies, the middle installments, don't usually have the, the same amount of payoff that the first and the third movie do. No, but there's still a sense of like an ending, which I think this mm. didn't have for me as much. Okay. Once it ended, I was like, that's it? What? Like yeah. I thought I understand that. Thirty that minutes. I was surprised that there wasn't movie. more. It was so fast. Oh. Yeah, like, it's <laughs> it's efficient. But I mean, yeah. I, I I know what you mean. Like the second act definitely feels like there's more to tell. Um, 
like Empire especially, like it leaves off so much at the end, yet it still yeah. feels like it ends. Like it's very bittersweet. But Same with Two Towers. Do you Towers. think that it feels like it ends in hindsight because we've seen Return of the Jedi, so we know what it's setting up? Maybe? Because I am... Ima- I- you know, I wasn't born when Empire Strikes Back came out. God, I wish I was so I could see it in theaters. That would oh, be amazing. Oh but God. I wonder if, if I had seen it on opening night in theaters, if I would have thought, wow, that ending left a lot to be desired. The first yeah. one ended with the parade where the characters got medals and the Death Star blew up and it was a very definitive ending. Mm-hmm. And this one ended with, like, Han being put in carbonite. The bad guys kind of won. The characters are just sad luke lost an arm yeah. vader's his father and i don't know what that means for for the story now like i feel like i would have thought wow that was a really weird place to end it but in hindsight when it's part of this amazing trilogy i can say i love empire and the ending to empire is incredible and so resonant and i think right? we can all agree empire is easily the best star wars movie i mean yeah easily yeah <laughs> You know, right next to Attack of the Clones. No. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> right next to the Clone Wars theatrical movie. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Remember um, that? Dude. <laughs> I saw it in the theater. But yeah. I, I think... Dude, so did I. When I was like a kid. Yeah. I liked it. Weird tangent. My favorite part of that stupid movie is that there's a, a fight scene where during the fight, Anakin goes... Hey, Ahsoka, I could use some help. And then after the fight, he's all pissy and mad. And she's like, what's wrong? And he's like, I could have handled it on my own. And that's a really good lesson to screenwriters. Remember the dialogue that you've written. Don't forget <laughs> what you've already written. And then and then contradict it. Nice. I don't remember this, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a dumb movie. <laughs> Stupid. But Quiet Place 2. Yes. Very transitional. I liked that. I liked the ending, but I totally understand why it can feel unsatisfying for a lot of people. And I will say that if the third one doesn't pay off well, what this mm-hmm. sets up, then I will probably retroactively um, be less satisfied with it in the same way that I was with another Star Wars comparison, The Force Awakens. Uh-huh. Force Awakens oh. is like all set up. And when I saw it, I remember saying, I remember saying, it's really good. As long as the next one pays off what it sets up, it'll hold up well. And my friends were like, that's not a good judgment for I a movie. Disagree. You can't judge it based on a potential sequel. Mm-hmm. And Last Jedi didn't... We're not going to get into Last Jedi. I, I have complex thoughts about it. People are very polarized about that movie, and I don't want to get into it. But right. it didn't It didn't pay off what Force Awakens set up. It At just least didn't. not in the way people thought. Right. At least not in the way that Force Awakens... Uh, made it seem like it was going to be paid yeah, off. Exactly. Because there were payoffs, but not in the way that we... <sighs> well, yeah. We can talk about that another episode, obviously. But... Um... Should we? I don't know if we even should, man. I don't... <laughs> People get so pissy about Last Jedi. I, lo- I, 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 have, I have thoughts of the sequels. I, I, I don't think That's they're awful. I... I honestly don't think they're bad. I prefer fun but messy over boring and, like, the prequels. I'm sorry. I think the sequels are much better than the prequels. Oh, I agree. Like, they're watchable and they're fun. And I disagree with the Force Awakens. isn't it a great compliment to Quiet Place that we keep comparing it to Star Wars trilogies? I think so. That's pretty cool. Like, the amount of world building that this original movie from the last couple years has. Star Wars and Spielberg. Yeah. That's pretty cool for, for Krasinski. Yeah. Um, um, I would agree get with you now? on, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, I want to talk about like what you were saying with, um, cause okay. you're right about like empire having that kind of ending, but empire was a completely well structured, well paced, well thought out two and a half hour long movie that mm-hmm. felt like this is how, like, this is the ending. There's left to be desired, but I still watched the complete movie. For some reason, Quiet Place 2 feels like a long one act. Yeah, that's that's totally correct. So that's why, it is, it definitely for me, is... it felt more sudden rather than, oh man, I can't wait for the next one. It's like, wait, what? Like, I, I yeah. thought there was 30 minutes left. Like, I don't feel that way with Empire at all. With Empire, it's like... Yeah, no, that's that's totally accurate. You know what it, I mean? It's like, not I understand in what real you're time, but it almost feels like it is because its momentum never really lets down. 
Right. And there's really only ever, like, one goal, one objective in the movie. Like, yeah. It's very, uh, I agree with you. But it's weird, because it's, it's not bad. Like, at all. I think it's very good. I think it's very good, yeah. Which is weird, because I would normally say a movie that doesn't have that sense of structure would be bad. And not mm -hmm. movies, not every movie, I think, needs to have a clear structure. You know, if you just want structure, go read a book. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, this is, these are movies. We're telling things, you know, through pictures. Um, but um, it did feel more like... I'm going to guess it right now. I, once the third movie comes out, I think this these trilogies and movies are going to be like really long one, two, three acts. The first one's going to be the long I agree. first act. The second one's going to be the long second act. And the third one's going to be the big finale. I agree. And the midpoint of the second one, which would thereby be the midpoint of the whole trilogy, would be the marker of the transition between um, right. two settings and between, which I won't spoil, mm -hmm. and between John Krasinski uh, passing the torch to Millicent Simmons as the main character right, of the right. series, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, I think we can get into spoilers. Spoilers, people. Okay, spoilers. But let's talk about the opening of this movie after the uh, the, the day one scene, because I think it does a similar thing to um, to killing, not, not as powerful, but a similar thing to killing the kid in the first scene of the first one, mm -hmm. is when they're running through the woods and Noah Jupe gets his foot in the oh, bear trap. Oh, Jesus. Oh my God, that moment. It's so visceral, the right? The poor kid, yeah. The it's scream. like, you feel it. Of course he can't help himself screaming. He's a kid. And, and Emily it, Blunt's like, like, that's like, the, one of the most please, painful please, things please. you can experience. Yeah, and Emily Blunt's performance when she's, like, begging him to stop. Like, she's looking at him, she's holding his face, and she's like, I, I can't, I can't. It's so hard for her to, like, hold his mouth shut because she, you know, she knows he's in so much pain and he needs to cry and she wants him to let him out. She doesn't blame him, but my God, does she want him to, like... Yeah. It, it, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a it's, great it's moment. It's such a, a, a thrilling, visceral moment. Yeah. And it's it's the moment where you just go, well, shit. Like, yeah, exactly. That's it. They're <laughs> yeah. done for. Basically, what, that's yeah. That's it. What, what, what could get them out of this? Yeah, like, shit. They're... Now what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, and what does get them out of it is the reveal of Killian Murphy being yeah. alive. And um, who I really liked in the movie. I thought he was very good. Yeah. I liked him a lot. Um, it, again, with the kind of um, theme of filling in. Filling in uh, someone else's shoes, someone great, someone's mm -hmm. great shoes. Um, yeah, great, uh, great character, great character moments. I think this one's smarter, personally, in terms of like what okay. the characters do, especially that great moment on the pier. I yeah. love that scene and just how smart. I love how smart both characters act in that scene. And it's the like... setup in the beginning with the with the dive. I yeah, love the that. Dive sign language. Holy yeah. crap. Yeah, great moment. Um, That scene is kind of funny and weird because it's like, there's these weird, like, Last of Us style sea, sea people. Sea, um, I think maybe cannibals. And I, <laughs> I think cannibals. I did not understand, like, what they are and what they do and what their intentions are. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't care, no. to, be, to be honest. But, like, at the end of that scene, I was like, hmm. That left a lot of questions. Like, that, yeah, in the that right really way, didn't. I yeah. think. Yeah, I was like, I, I like that in the sense of world building of like having some mystery, but, and you know, it's set up earlier that Killian Murphy says like most of the people that are still left aren't worth saving. Exactly, this, like this like, some, like you will not them. believe what what some people have become because of this. Yeah. It's like, oh shit, like there's something else then. Yeah, and so, but I, I kind of just in the same way that you were saying with the last movie, you were like how did this not happen? I was like, how did these guys not just get on boats and leave for the island themselves? Like, why do they want to trap these people? It's strange. Right, right. Oh, true. Like, it raises questions like, yeah. what led them to go the crazy like this? Why aren't yeah. they going to the island? But I liked that scene because it was so, like you said, it was just so smartly written as far as how the characters get like, out of this They were situation. definitely threatening. 
mm-hmm. threatening and yeah like it was it was a smart like escape yeah oh cool characters are smart in a horror movie i like that yeah. <laughs> but it's what i like about it is that even though it's a smart escape it is imperfect no right yeah. because yeah, the yeah. alien still gets on the boat and that that small mistake that they make leads to the big problem in act three yeah which is uh, i like that i like when each little tiny mistake in a movie that is this precise and acute and requires characters to be really really clever when a little tiny mistake can cause big consequences right right uh i agree just yeah really good (laughs) it's a little silly that it floated all the way there but it's set up perfectly that it was it managed to get on the boat and no one saw it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it leads to like a fun attack moment. And the, which reminded me a lot of The Mist also. Um, mm. um, what's his name? That African-American actor? The one that's in this movie? G- Jimon Ponsu? Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought like what great like he's underrated character actor by the very way. Very underrated. He's in so many things. Yeah, he's great. Um, he dies, <laughs> sadly. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's not um, in the movie for very long, but no. I do think they really endear you to his character before he dies. Yeah, yeah, uh, I in agree. a short amount of time. Yeah, like his role in the island, how he reacts to like like the, when when the actual alien was attacking the 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 island the way him and his kids were reacting to it is almost like rehearsal yeah you notice that like when they were putting him into the closet they were completely unfazed he's like all right let's get in the car it's almost like if this has happened before you know what i mean which i which are good little details like that but um yeah and he's just smart i think both these movies like have a real knack for just making you appreciate and like when a character is smart yeah yeah. smart i love i love that too yeah, I think the second half of the movie is stronger for sure. The opening is great. And then I was questioning where I was going. And then once I realized where I was going and then the second act happened, I'm like, yeah, this is great. This is fun. I would, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to like this more on the second watch. Because like I said, the first time, the first act, I'm like, where is this going? I'm not really that interested. Um, I miss John. And then I understand. So, um, I mean, I, I'm, do you have more to say about the movie? I'm pretty sure you do. Yeah. Um, I like how the movie splits up the family into two pairs. The first being, um, Emily Blunt and Noah Jupe who are mm-hmm. stuck in their position. And the second yeah. being Millicent Simmons and Killian Murphy who are pushing forth, um, who are pushing forth towards this new Island to try to, um, try to send out a signal and help their family and others reach a safe haven. Right. 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 Um, the possibility of a safe haven. Cause at that point we just hear, uh, a so- we hear what beyond the sea on the radio and yeah, she's like, there's some place out there and we need to find it. And so it's kind of like a, like a risk. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Great side quest. Uh, not side quest, but you know what I mean? Well, it kind of becomes the main quest. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, it 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 feels but like a side quest, it but it becomes like... like the central, yeah, like uh, central quest to push push yeah. the story forward. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think there's that point, kind of in the f- like between the first and second act, like that transition between the first and second act is a little weird because what will become the main quest feels like a side quest, and it feels like you don't know where they're going. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think in in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense. For needing to get the story to a certain place, but in the moment it feels like I don't totally get what the goal is right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, where I was kind of pull, pulled out of the movie for a little bit. Yeah, but but um, I really think that the way it separates the family into the two pairs is smart because you've got these kind of like dual reflective character arcs. On one side, you've got Emily Blunt, who is incredibly brave in the mm-hmm. first movie and in this movie is incredibly brave, but um has to take care of this baby right and she has to go visit the grave of um of the child and she just she can't um completely provide for noah jupe anymore right Mm -hmm. the way that she has been completely providing for him in every way and 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 holding him in protection john krasinski isn't around anymore 
he needs to learn to um to protect himself and protect his family, right? Yeah, to be the man of the Noah Jupes, yeah. His character's main characteristic in the first movie and in the beginning of this one is that he's a scaredy cat. He's yeah. afraid. Mm-hmm. Um, and he really has to overcome that in the movie. And by the end of the movie is a gun-wielding... <laughs> Badass. <laughs> action hero, kind of. <laughs> um, at the very, very, very end. Yeah, yeah um, like literally like the and, last second, few seconds of the movie. Yeah. And there's a really... like again visceral gut-wrenching sequence in this movie where he's having to like split the remaining oxygen that's left between him and the baby because they're locked in this vault yeah that's running out of air it's crazy and on the other side of that you've got killian murphy and millicent simmons so on both you've got one adult and one child and you've got one male and one female but it's flipped with these two killian murphy is kind of the coward Early on, they reveal that he's known that this family is alive since since this began, but he has been afraid to reach out to them because after his family died, he didn't want to risk um, reaching out to other families and exposing himself and letting... The, he just wanted to hide and isolate yeah, yeah. himself mm-hmm. and survive. Mm-hmm. And he kind of lived in this cowardice for a long time. Millicent Simmons is the one that convinces him to break that and to Mm -hmm. push forward because she's really brave and she understands that she needs to step into John Krasinski's shoes and she helps see Killian Murphy that he does as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Because Killian Murphy is the opposite of Lee. Lee was a man who sacrificed himself so that his family could live. Killian Murphy is a father with children and a wife and they're the ones that died and he lived. Mm -hmm. So, I think the dual um, character arcs and the, the sort of the ways the two relationships are like kind of mirrored of each other uh, was really smart. Yeah. Simple, but it's smart. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's effective. You know, it's not, it's what this movie needs. This kind of movie, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's well done. It's nothing super deep, but it works. Mm. And it works so well. Yeah. Um, um, and I think I really underestimated John Krasinski's contribution to the script of the first movie. Like, I was very skeptical of this going in, knowing that Beck and Woods didn't have anything to do with the script for the sequel. Because I kind of had this idea in my head that they did all the heavy lifting on the script for the first one, and John Krasinski just edited some stuff and then directed it. Um, and that since he was writing the sequel alone, it wouldn't be as good. But nope. if you told me that they had the same writers, the two scripts, I would have believed you. And mm-hmm. it didn't feel like Beck and Woods were missing that much maybe in in the sense that there was less actual silence which is really my only major flaw with the second one it feels a bit less inventive because um there are certain ways that they get around having to be absolutely silent like Mm -hmm. they do in the first one right when they're in the vault there's like the soundproof vault that the characters go in in some scenes when they reach the island before the alien arrives there there's like a couple scenes where they get to just talk like normal. Yeah, because at that point you don't need to be, which I think is a right. great um, visceral reaction because you're like so used to being quiet and being yeah um, used to the silence. And so hearing mm-hmm. the the communal, you know, talking and the, 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 the fire, it's like almost... Uh, you almost panic at first because it's like, shut up. Mm-hmm. But then you realize, holy crap, like this has been here this entire time. I, I think, uh, yeah. I, I see what you're saying, but I think it was uh, it was done pretty well. Oh, we got to talk about the ending. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of just did, but. Yeah, where basically. It ends on a real, on a real cliffhanger. Yeah, more so than the first. Yeah. The first isn't really in a cliffhanger. You know what's going to happen here. You don't know where it's gonna go. Yeah, like it, it's more of a of an ending towards their uh towards the characters' arcs. Mm-hmm. Like they've they've made that step to kind of step up and lead the family and fill in their father's shoes. But um, in terms of everything else, that's left to be discovered in the third one. Yeah. Emily Blunt is still on the other island. Um, yeah, the family is still 
separated by a great yeah, measure it's, it's, of distance. It's almost like Empire. The ocean. <laughs> yeah. In a way. But, um, yeah. But what, what do you the, have, the what thing do you that say? the ending does definitively say is that the kids have grown the hell up. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, they have kind sure. of reached the point where they're now ready to lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it cuts off before we get to see them do that, mm-hmm. which I think is what I'm excited to see in the third one. Um, and there's also a greater kind of assumption to be made. Like at the end of the first one, she cocks the shotgun and you're like, okay, she's going to go shoot these aliens. But yeah. at this one, it ends with Millicent Simmons doing the, the, um, the hearing aid signal in this microphone that's going out like to the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. right it's going out overseas and so the idea the hope is that other people will hear it and understand this advantage this this thing that they've just that this family that millicent simmons has discovered and be able to fight for themselves as well and that they're gonna like help the world fight back against these aliens but that's a much bigger assumption that like other people are gonna hear it and understand <laughs> yeah so that's why i like i think the ending is not as satisfying or powerful as the first Mm -hmm. but um again it's still like i just kind of heard the chatter in the theater like oh man now i want more now i want to see the third one so it definitely still leaves room for more to happen whereas with the first one it's like nope perfect great ending just one movie another great segue but i do think it doesn't wrap up as much as well as I would want it to because I do feel like that's it like I I thought Mm -hmm. there was going to be more it felt like an awkward uh I think uh Damien Giselle ends his movies like there's no denouement in his movies it just kind of ends like on the high point the emotional high Mm -hmm. point and then the movie ends and you're kind of left off with that the movie I think this tried to do that but it didn't have, um, it wasn't as, um, it was more emotionally satisfying rather than narratively satisfying, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. So, whereas with like Damien Chiselle's, because I always think of his endings as, I think his endings are the best, where it just Yeah, Whiplash is pretty comparable. A, Whiplash la la land even first man just like kind of end with like the high points of the movie with like the high mm-hmm. point of emotion yet the narrative is done too so but here i felt like there was there could there could have been a little bit more narrative but mm-hmm. the emotion was there so yeah i don't hate the ending at all i really don't it was just like what i thought there was gonna be more. Ah, okay third one let's right. let's see what happens so you want to rate it uh yeah so for now um a seven out of ten um okay. like i said i i was more uh like for a while i thought i missed john I'm not sure where this is really going but once i realized where i was going and um what the arcs were and what the emotional payoffs were i was totally into it i love the way it's directed the acting the performances uh that's the same thing the characters and the performances and just the overall look of the movie, the presentation, the setting, great stuff. Um, yeah, 7 out of 10 for now. I feel like it'll get higher on a second viewing so I can appreciate more of the setups from the first act. And Yeah, 7 out of 10 for now. What about you? I'm going to give it an 8. Nice. Um, I cannot wait to see John Krasinski's career as a director. He yeah. is extremely skillful i mean he just has that he's just efficient he's just skillful it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just on a craft level it's just damn good filmmaking and you wouldn't um, think right jim from the office making something this I know. well done like wow yeah I'd definitely give him props yeah it's it's very impressive it's yeah extremely impressive all right guys go see it recommend it fun good movies yeah go see it uh, in theaters, if you can, if you have a safe theater near you. Right. Uh, if you feel safe um, and ready, go for it. I recommend it. It's definitely a theater experience movie. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Because, again, 
it's one of those things and this is like so rare people use it as an expression but it's rare that i mean it this literally the whole theater everybody is sitting on the edge of their seat the whole time (laughs) that scene there's a scene and it's maybe the most like like tense gut-wrenching scene in the movie and it's literally millicent simmons crawling through a window and trying not to knock over oh my a cup god of coffee. yes I, 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 and i was yeah. literally like leaning forward on the edge of my seat like biting my nails it was amazing love it i love like moments like that at the movies yeah great yeah. stuff see in the theaters if you can if not i think it's on like paramount plus if Is anyone it? has that i think so hmm. weird <laughs> Be me. streaming service where you can watch quiet place 2 and the iCarly reboot <laughs> iCarly reboot and spongebob's movie sponge on the run nice which i haven't seen what a great library <laughs> sold i love it i like it <coughs> oh god COVID. Step, before we uh, hop off as per usual what have you been watching this week any recommendations oh god um so since we've been um off for a bit i Besides Quiet Place, what I've been, what have I, I kind of been just rewatching. Oh my gosh, I rewatched the uh, Fantastic Four, not Fan Four Stick. Fantastic Four. Oh, the like the yeah, the Chris Evans one. Yeah. Uh, it's not good, but I would rather see that over Fan Four Stick any day. Like, I mean, I was never bored. It's stupid, and some casting is really bad. And some of the effects are really bad, but it had the potential to be a Sam Raimi Spider Man. I don't know because I hadn't seen that movie in forever. I loved it as a kid, but um, obviously it's like one of those like, like a Batman or Robin or like a, mm-hmm. a X Men Origins Wolverine type of thing, and uh, I can see that for some people, but I didn't think it was awful. I was kind of entertained by it, but I don't know. It's whatever. Um, I rewatched Parasite. Great movie, obviously. I finally got around to seeing The King of Staten Island. Have you seen that? I have. It's good, but it's a Jed Apatow movie, which means it's yeah. five hours long. Scenes go on too long because there's improv, yeah. and it's kind of depressing. And you feel like I thought it had. After. I thought it had excellent performances. Yeah. Um, from people that I wouldn't expect to give those kind of performances, like Pete Davidson and Bill Burr, and right. Marissa Tomei. Right, but right. um, Jesus Christ, Judd, learn how to edit a movie. I know. Oh my God, it's. Do you know how to use the cut tool? Jesus. <laughs> or like just edit a scene. Like I know he likes improv, but some scenes just yeah. go on too long. I'm like all right, yeah. that scene cut. Just some moments did not need to be there. But overall, yeah. I, I like it. It felt very personal to Pete Davidson. I find him yeah. very funny. I, like, I love dark humor. Um, Bill Burr is a gem. I adore that man. Um, I uh, went to the... Actually, uh, it was recently the 40th anniversary of Raiders of the Lost Ark. and um, I'm so jealous that you saw that in theaters. I man. saw it in the theater, oh. and it was perfect. Big screen, big sound. Um, I know I've said City Lights is my favorite movie. I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is my favorite movie. I'm not even kidding. It's overtaken it? I, yeah. Yeah. Man. I, I, I can't think of, like, another movie that's, like... I think I put it in, like, my review for Letterboxd. Like, I love a good character uh, character piece, dramas, two-handers, you know, stuff like Marriage Story or, like, Persona or, like... Yeah. Um, you know, it's just dramas. Like, I love that stuff. Yeah. But Raiders of the Lost Ark is why we go to the movies. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's why we go to the movies. As we're recording this, I'm sitting under a massive poster of Raiders. I, I, same. I got one recently. (laughs) (laughs) It's like right over my bed. Harrison Ford texts me in before I sleep. But, um, (laughs) yeah, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. I, I look forward to talking about those movies I think when five comes out, that would be yeah. A we should time. definitely do a, an Indiana Jones episode. Yeah, for sure. I can't believe that that's actually happening. Like, did you see the set photos of 
in he's Harrison like 90. Ford. Like how, I, I, he's so I hope he's okay. Old. He's going to do stunts and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm Crazy. watching it. I'm going to be there Thursday night. <laughs> but I'm still like, he's so old. How are they going to pull it off? I don't know. We'll see. James Mango did it with Logan, so I think you can do it with Indiana Yeah, I Jones. think he's a very good choice as a director. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope he very brings skillful. back the, the grit of like the first few movies. Mm-hmm. But um, I also watched Bo Burnham's Inside, and we can quickly talk about that when you bring it up. Yeah, that was that was in my list too. Yeah, but um, if you guys aren't aware of this, it's a comedy special. That's not really a comedy special. It was filmed by Bo Burnham, who who is a really like kind of ex- existential and experimental stand up comedian that has a couple other really good specials on Netflix: Make Happy and What. Uh, he filmed it alone with no crew, edited it alone with, with no editor. He, he did everything. He wrote, he directed, he edited. It's really impressive. He did it all in like a small guest house over several months. And it's incredible. It's, it's largely comedic. Some of it is not funny. Some of it is just kind of watching his mental health spiral and it's yeah. sad. Um, it's an experience. I don't, I don't even, I can't really say that it's like a comedy special or a document. It's just, it's an experience. It's insanely it. cathartic, I think, especially yes. being a creator, kind of being forced to be inside. It definitely captures, like we, we can totally talk about this for an episode. There's like so much to talk about it. It's, I, could. I saw a comment on it and I thought it was perfect. It is basically the comedic version of Pink Floyd's The Wall whoa <laughs> oh okay which i completely wow. agree with i guess yeah i mean it's like a different experience but it's it's That's so saying funny. so much through music and through sequences and yeah. imagery and the fact that he did it by himself my god yeah bo burnham he's uh and He's insanely He's talented. an incredibly talented musical composer. It's wild. For a 30-year-old stand-up comedian, like, I want him to write a musical. I think he's writing the music for, like, a Sesame Street Sesame movie. Street. Yeah, right? Yeah, he is. Which, there's, like, a song in the in the special that sounds <laughs> perfectly yeah. for Sesame Street. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that not lyrics-wise. Uh, <laughs> but musically. <laughs> That is how yeah. the world lyrics wise, it's a bit works. dark for Sesame Street, but hell, the freaking puppet comes out of. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you know the world is built with blood? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, great stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah, ex- extremely good. Yeah. Um. But what have you been watching, Colby? I watched that. I watched it twice in a row. Um. And nice. then um. Um. Two days ago. Um. I went to the movie theater to watch an old movie that I've wanted to watch for a very long time, hadn't got around to it, and then saw that for whatever reason, I'm not sure exactly why, they did a re-release in Regal Theaters, and I thought, what a great opportunity to see it for the first time. Um, Seb, tell me if you've seen this movie or heard of it. To Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. No, wait a minute. <laughs> what? No. Have you heard I of this I saw that you posted that. Yeah. But it's great. Is it? Yeah, that's the title, dude. It listen, Too I got I got for everything Julie Newman. Yeah, Julie Newmar. Ju- uh, oh, <laughs> Julie Who, Newmar. by the way, Julie Newmar is an actual real world actress. She played Catwoman in the 1966 Batman. Nice. She is not really like in the movie. <laughs> it's not about her. Okay. Anyways, um th- let me just drop this premise on you. It's a movie where Patrick Swayze, mm-hmm. Wesley Snipes, and John Leguizamo play drag queens. Okay. They do the entire movie in full drag. The entire movie. The whole movie. It's great. It's real good. And are it's they, real good. Is it about them being drag queens, or they just they just happen to be? It's drag about queens? them. It's about them going on a road trip. I would say, yeah, like it does revolve around them being drag queens, but it's not like a like a super deep and complex character study in the trials and tribulations of, uh, it's, it's a pretty, um, positive, 
uh, fun comedy. There were serious moments that touch on issues, but I mean, for 1995, it was just very ahead of its time as far as um, like LGBT depictions. And uh, I th- I really enjoyed it. I thought it was extremely fun. Um, and I was completely alone in the auditorium watching it on this big screen, eating my peanut M&Ms. It nice. was so nice. It was the perfect movie viewing experience. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. Um, I've never heard of this. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. And then the next day, I went to see In the Heights. Oh, segue. <laughs> ah. uh, we're going to be talking about In the Heights next episode, which is the new uh, movie directed by John M. Chu, Oof. adapted from the Broadway musical, uh, directed by, not directed by, written by and starring. Lin Manuel Miranda, mm-hmm. directed by I believe Thomas Kale. Um, and we're also going to be talking about our favorite movie musicals. Correct. Should we mention what they are, or no? No, I think we should leave that as a surprise. We can like give it. a little hint, though. I like it. Um, um. Oh, here's a hint. Here's a hint. Oh, maybe that's too on the nose. I'll cut it out if it is. If you don't like it, okay. but both of our movies heavily feature umbrellas oh hey, holy crap oh. that's perfect yeah okay that is perfect i love it good good stuff I, yeah i like it good stuff okay guys um hope you enjoyed the episode um so yeah that's the next one in the heights and fairy musicals we may or may not have <laughs> a guest oh i just proved my earlier point wrong i just sneezed during the show nice we're keeping it in i couldn't hold it in <laughs> That's staying in. All right, guys. I, we got we got to end this episode because I'm about to get murdered. I'm hungry. <laughs> All right, God. Bye. Bye. Tune in next week. See ya. Be quiet. Hush, hush. Hush, hush, hush.